Shakira, are we, we're live. Okay, I see it. We are live and good to go. All right, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. 
We are so excited to have you for our second edition of Conversations with the Council. Uh, my name is Amber Jones. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Council of Minnesotans, for Minnesotans of African Heritage. Um, and I am really excited to host this series this summer um, over the uh, August and September months to have some really critical and amazing conversations with our community, with our state, on issues that are directly impacting the African heritage community. Um, and so today our conversation is going to center around public safety. And we decided to go a different direction with this event um, to really focus on what um, impact can we have directly at the state in particular to have this conversation be led by four amazing colleagues of ours in the state system um, who are doing really critical and essential work um, to ensure that our criminal justice system is a system that will work to actually benefit our communities and not to criminalize or put us in danger um, in so many ways that we have experienced. And so we're excited to bring in some of our partners throughout the state system to have this conversation. I'm just gonna pull up our slide deck once more um, so that we can get started with uh, this afternoon's event. Um, as I get started, just to um, give us some quick reminders to make sure if you have any questions on Zoom, make sure you're using that Q&A function. Feel free to engage in conversation via the chat function. We are taking a look at those questions. All of us can see them um, so that we are able to address your comments, concerns, and uh, questions, especially um, with such well-versed and intelligent people on our call today um, who can really add, answer some really important questions about how we navigate this system at the state level. So please, please, please feel free to ask questions. And then also if you're viewing on Facebook, feel free to ask questions. We are also monitoring the chat function um, or the comment section on our um, Facebook live stream as well. Um, and if you um, want to share this conversation with people who may not be able to tune in in the 4 to 530 range, it will stay up on our Facebook page. It will also be posted to YouTube. So please, 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 let's keep the conversation going. So first, I want to um, introduce the council to you all for people who may be new um, or just want a refresher about what our mission is. So the mission for the council um, is as follows. So the Minnesota legislature empowered the council for Minnesotans of African heritage to ensure that people of African heritage fully and effectively participate in and equitably benefit from the political, social, and economic resources, policies, and procedures of the state of Minnesota. So we are really here to really help you all and to build with you all and to partner with you all as our community to make sure that we are benefiting from what's happening at the state. To briefly go over um, some of the work of the council, we conduct statewide community outreach and engagement that is largely in my wheelhouse as the outreach coordinator, um, doing events like this, um, working with community partners and stakeholders um, throughout the state, really building up our, our relationship with African heritage people in greater Minnesota, as well as here in the metro area. Um, it's really important to us as a council that we're not just going off of our own knowledge of what we think the African heritage community needs, but actively engaging, actively reaching out, actively partnering. Uh, we also advance legislative policies with a direct impact on the African heritage community. Um, our legislative and policy director, Jasmine Carey, leads a lot of this work to make sure we are translating the needs um, and the solutions coming from our community into direct policy change um, at the state level. And we also advise lawmakers and executive leadership, um, as was alluded to in our mission. One of the core functions of the council is to be a direct um, advisor to the governor, and the governor's office, to the cabinet, to um, the state legislature um, on issues that affect us. So now I'm going to 
introduce our panelists for today. Super excited to um, introduce these folks who are really excited to have a direct conversation um, about these issues with us. So the first person that I'm going to introduce is Nicole Archbold. She is the Community Affairs Director for the Department of Public Safety. Archbold's background covers more than two decades of local government experience, including 15 years at the Minneapolis Police Department. During her time at MPD, she held roles assigned to the Property and Evidence Unit, Research and Policy Development Unit, and Police Administration. Archbold also served in the Mayor, Minneapolis Mayor's Office as the city's public safety policy advisor, where she led community center public safety initiatives and supported efforts to increase transparency and data analysis in policing. Nicole holds a Bachelor of Science in Law Enforcement from Metropolitan State University and a master's degree in public safety administration from St. Mary's University. We are excited to welcome you, Nicole. Thank you for being here today. Our next panelist from to, for today's event is Adel Shuku Zadeh, Department of Human Rights. He is the Community Outreach Director, Community Engagement Director for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Adele's work focuses on engaging with communities to ensure all Minnesotans can live dignified lives free from discrimination. An organizer at heart, Adele brings together his expertise in communications and policy research and applies an equity and inclusion lens to identify opportunities to forge partnership to protect every Minnesotan's civil rights. Adele received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Communications from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He holds a Master of Public Policy from the Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Adele, for joining us today. And our next two panelists um, I will introduce for us. The next panelist we have today is Jamal Lundy. He's a committee administrator in the Minnesota House of Representatives. He's done a lot of great work um, specifically around the most recent public safety package that was passed during the special session. He is a community activist, electoral organizer, and political staffer. He has a law degree from Mitchell Hamlin Law School. He is interested in administrative law and how systemic biases affect the effectiveness of institutions. Jamel currently works at the Minnesota House of Representatives where he has experience working on education and criminal justice reform issues. And finally, to round us out, we have Keon Dusty the Outreach Coordinator with the Office of Attorney General Keith Ellison. And in this role, he will ensure that all Minnesotans are included in Attorney General Ellison's work and priorities. Before joining the office, he served as Organizing Director for then Representative Ellison's campaigns for Congress and Attorney General. He has worked in electoral politics for six years Kian is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and is currently a 2L at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. And may I take a point of personal privilege here? Kian is actually a former intern of mine. And so I'm so excited to see where he is in his career as well. So I, you know, I had to put a plug in when I can put a plug. <laughs> so as we get started uh, with today's conversation, um, we are going to take some time to hear directly from our panelists where they will have an opportunity to talk about um, their department or office's body of work at the state and how it relates to major issues of public safety and criminal justice reform, particularly as it relates to Minnesota's African heritage communities. Um, so with this um, time, I'm going to actually turn it over to our first panelist, Nicole Archbold, who is going to kick us off with some of her work at the Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Nicole. Well, thank you, Amber. Thank you for the invitation to join you today. And um, I'm gonna talk briefly about DPS and then I'm gonna talk about the working group on deadly force encounters that, um, that we worked on. Um, 
But first, I want to acknowledge my fellow panelist, Kian Ducey, who worked uh, quite a bit with me on this project that I'm going to speak to right now. And then also our representative, Rena Moran, who was a working group member and did a lot of work shepherding through um, some really terrific legislation that's reflective of the recommendations um, that, that we're going to share today. So um, let me get my presentation out. All right. So, um, yes, Department of Public Safety. And this isn't clicking. There we go. So, the Department of Public Safety, our commissioner, our leader is uh, Commissioner John Harrington. We have a workforce of just over 2,000 employees that um, cover 14 divisions. 10 of which are public facing. Um, you can see here, you probably recognize some of them. Um, one that most Minnesotans are familiar with is driver and vehicle services. And that was one I wasn't um, too familiar with as being a part of the Department of Public Safety until I worked here. Uh, my role as Community Affairs Director, internally I'm focused on increasing language access and inclusive messaging and communication so that um, we can better connect with um, all Minnesotans. Um, my external focus is building partnerships and collaboration opportunities. And over the last year, I've spent quite a bit of time um, working on this project here, the Minnesota Working Group on Police Involved Deadly Force Encounters, uh, which was convened and led by Commissioner John Harrington and Attorney General Keith Ellison. Together, they served as co-chairs of this working group. Um, the working group had 18 members that um, represented a broad cross-section of stakeholders um, from around Minnesota. And then the working group provided a framework for even more stakeholders to be able to um, provide ideas and recommendations and contribute to the process. So the timeline of the working group, um, in January 2019, when the Attorney General and Commissioner Harrington um, came on to their new positions at the state, um, they had some conversations and identified um, deadly force encounters as something that they were going to prioritize and work on together. Um, in March of 2019, I came on board and was tasked with developing the process for this. Uh, July of last year, they announced the formation of the working group in August. They held their first hearing, and it was actually uh, a year ago this week that the first hearing kicked off for the working group. February of this year, they announced recommendations, 28 recommendations, along with 33 action steps um, to take that can prevent or reduce or better respond to deadly force encounters. And then um, we have a final report coming due um, this fall. To help us with this process, we identified um, a subject matter expert, a national expert to come and help us, and that was Ron Davis. He worked in the Obama administration at the Department of Justice. He was also the executive director of the 21st Century Policing Task Force, which the model they used to build that report is the model that we um, followed here at the state. Uh, the purpose of the working group, first, they needed to find common ground across all the stakeholders. So you had, uh, remember, a, a very diverse cross-section of um, perspectives and voices at the table, and they started by finding areas of common ground. Um, they defined actionable steps that would um, directly impact the outcomes or um, prevent deadly force encounters. And something else to recognize, a statewide effort had never been done before in the United States. This is a pervasive issue, and Minnesota was the first to lead and take the initiative um, to, to look at systemic ways that we can address this issue. So the working group held a number of hearings and listening sessions around the state. Um, it, this is a statewide issue, as you'll see in a slide or two. Um, and so we were we went all around. We were in Mankato, Cloquet, Brooklyn Park, and Minneapolis, Bemidji, Worthington, and St. Paul. Um, we had testimony from nearly 50 subject matter experts, along with affected um, families and community members. Um, and then the feedback that we received early on helped to shape the rest of the process. The first hearing uh, was disrupted, and we took that feedback and learned from it. And um, in the future, modified agendas and added a couple additional working group members to better represent 
um, stakeholders. So the hearings were organized around these four themes. Uh, and one of the takeaways that we, um, that really framed a lot of the effort and the need for this statewide conversation is that 60% of the officer involved shootings that happened in Minnesota over the last five years have happened in greater Minnesota. Uh, a lot of the perception and perspective seems to be that they mostly happen in Minneapolis or St. Paul or Hennepin or Ramsey County. Um, but you know, a significant number happen in the metro, but you can see on this map here that um, greater Minnesota is also deeply affected. And then we also learned that the majority of these encounters happen with someone experiencing a crisis. And the working group organized their recommendations around uh, five pillars here, community healing and engagement, prevention and training, investigations and accountability, policy and legal implications, and officer wellness. The criteria in order for a recommendation to be a recommendation, it needed to fall within the mandate of the working group. So that meant that it needed to be specific to deadly force encounters, um, not broader or other systemic issues, but very narrowly and specifically related to deadly force encounters. It needed to have an impact on, on reducing them. It needed to be an actionable and identifiable um, recommend, uh, recommendation with actionable and identifiable steps. And then it needed to address both the concerns of the community and law enforcement. So who's responsible for these recommendations and getting the, getting the business done? So many of the recommendations fall to DPS and the authority of the commissioner to implement them. Uh, other recommendations designated um, the legislature, the post board, or tribal or local governments as those that had the responsibility to lead um, and start moving on those efforts. So some of the um, progress that's been made and, and things that have been adopted out of the recommendations. Um, in July of this year, the Driver and Vehicle Services Manual was updated to include information for both, um, information about what Drivers can expect on a traffic stop from both police officers and the public. Um, the VCA hired a victim, family, and community relations coordinator. So there is someone there now who's able to work with families and take the time and spend with them um, as they're going through this terrific trauma. Um, and the next three that I'm going to mention were um, wrapped in the Police Accountability Act that passed. These were recommendations, but also um, attached with legislation that moved this year. So the BCA is gonna be developing an independent and specialized investigations unit that's gonna handle specifically these types of cases. Uh, they received funding and appropriation from that too, for, from the legislature for that. Um, the law enforcement agencies across Minnesota are now required to report all uses of deadly force that result in substantial injury or death. Um, previously, you know, one of the things around police reform and data um, is, is that not every police agency reports out their data. There's over 18,000 police departments in the nation and there is no national database. So you, as we all know, um, there are different places that are tracking incidents, but there is no mandatory reporting. And now in Minnesota, it's mandatory for all law enforcement agencies to make this information public, to report it, and it will become part of a database. And then in addition to complement that, the BCA is um, developing a data collection and reporting system that will track this information. So that is a big step. Um, additional things that were recommendations that also um, became legislation. The, there was a change to the statute on the use of deadly force, which becomes effective in March of next year. Uh, they strengthened the role of the post board. There was additional funding provided for um, autism and mental health training. All law enforcement agencies must update their use of force policies to include duty to report, duty to intervene, and consideration of less lethal measures. So that is another significant step um, in transforming the way that um, that these incidents unfold. And uh, finally, we have officer wellness, peer counseling, and data privacy measures that were taken because officer wellness is a significant factor in 
um, in this talk, in this conversation as well. So you can find the report online at dps.mn.gov. In the search bar, type in deadly force encounters and you'll pull up the recommendations. Um, so I hope, I hope the folks watching will take a, take a look and review that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Jamal Lundy, who works um, with the House of Representatives, and this is a great tie-in as you ended on the Police Accountability Act that just passed. A lot of that work, um, Jamal um, can attest to doing a lot of the work on the policy side, the legislative side. So Jamal, um, let's hear from you. Thank you for being here. Hey, how's it going? Just trying to get unmuted very quickly. I want to ensure folks can hear me. Um, you guys can hear me. Am I correct, Amber? Ooh, Amber? Sorry, I put myself on mute. Yes, no, we can hear you. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, so I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in nine minutes. Um, so very quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, my role is, uh, I serve with the privilege of Speaker Hortman, Chair Mariani, and I've worked very closely with uh, Chair Moran. Uh, Chair Mariani chairs the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee that has the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission, Department of Public Safety, among other uh, state agencies. Um, and Chair Moran chairs the uh, Posse Caucus, which uh, we work closely with in developing the Minnesota Police Accountability Act of 2020. Um, um, during our tenure in the legislature, we've addressed essentially every portion of criminal justice reform with over 40 ambitious criminal justice reform bills. So uh, I, unfortunately, nine minutes is truly inadequate, but I will attempt to talk uh, to broad themes and major items folks uh, already know about and uh, some major items that I think folks should know about. Um, and I've copied and pasted the outline of how I will do so uh, in the chat. So to begin, we, uh, Chair Mariani, previously chaired the, uh, the Education Policy Committee, so we came to work at the Public Safety Committee uh, a year and a half ago with very fresh lenses about the problems. And what we quickly found was that the Minnesota criminal justice system as a whole uh, was kind of at the brink. It was essentially at a turning point, um, and that we see that it is continually um, overcrowded and underfunded at the same time. And so we uh, felt that it was our duty to act on both of those things simultaneously. Um, there were several themes that tied all of our work, those 40 plus bills together. Um, one of, the, of those themes were um, community-centered public safety, redemption, and as of late, human rights. Uh, to quickly uh, speak to these three things, um, the uh, community-centered public safety was uh, actually modeled on uh, ideas brought to us around community policing. And if you are familiar with the, uh, the work of Mayor Carter, the city of St. Paul, he likes to uh, title this type of approach the community first police. Um, we find that oftentimes uh, that when there's a problem in a community, people immediately uh, reach for the police as the tool to solve that problem, whether it be mental health, domestic violence, sexual assault, and so forth. What we find is oftentimes um, these solutions are centered on, uh, you know, um, crime enforcement versus crime prevention, and, uh, and it's not centered on those who are actually impacted and the, those community voices. Um, and so what we try to do is shift that model and try to intentionally highlight um, for the folks who are affected most by crime, which are often communities of color. Um, those are our um, you know, LGBTQ plus communities and also our um, undocumented um, different mixed status communities. Um, and it changed the entire dynamic of our committee in doing so. Uh, we also uh, worked on uh, a theme of redemption uh, instead of punishment and of upholding basic human rights. And uh, that will come up uh, further when we talk in depth about the legislation we put forth with George Floyd. A big challenge for us when we arrived were um, the culture of the committee. Um, previously, it was chaired by Representative Johnson and that Representative uh, Cornish, which were GOP colleagues. And the culture of the committee was thought of as a quote-unquote cop committee. 
In fact, some of one of my colleagues will remark to me, uh, he's the committee to uh, the committee administrator for because all you do is just pass the budgets, give a couple things away to the cop, and call it a day. And the chair and I were kind of uh, taken aback by this culture, so we intentionally acted to change that culture that didn't produce um, outcomes for uh, those communities most impacted by crime. Um, and most impacted by us, I should also add, if, uh, you know, the criminal justice system. Um, so, um, and on, so we did three, there are three major actions we took that looked to change that culture. Uh, one was, um, I'm going to skip down to the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Um, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission has, since its creation, the ability to um, regulate probation and has yet to do so even though minnesota ranks among the highest in per capita or i'm sorry per population probation um, um case loads and individuals who are on probation and so uh, the chair um, actively took steps to raise uh, the fact that they have the ability to act and to actually uh and we as a committee passed out a probation cap which unfortunately didn't pass the law but because of um several steps we took to alter the culture uh, and the expectation on the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission are working in conjunction with incredible partners like Commissioner Schnell, like um, the chair, uh, Kelly Mitchell, and um, the uh, head of the public defenders. Uh, what we, um, or the public defenders representative, um, what we did is actually allow for the space for them to act independently on uh, which cap probation last year. Uh, secondly, on the issue of police accountability, we will get to the uh, bill and discussion of this session in, in one moment. But one thing that enabled us to, uh, as uh, the previous uh, presenter, Ms. Archibald, spoke to, um, secure those data, um, the new data collection um, requirements, was the fact that um, Chair Mariani and the Posse Caucus with Chair Moran came together to sign a letter saying that we will not approve any further police training funds unless uh, there is improved data collection and accountability and policing. Um, and during the negotiation, that letter was brought to the forefront and actually had a, a, a very persuasive power. But um, it's, um, I don't believe any time before that, um, uh, members of the uh, people of color, indigenous caucus, were brought together to indicate that this is one policy requirement that we will um, we will put our foot down uh, for and we will not pass unless um, there is um, adequate reform for both sides of the aisle. Um, and then um, lastly, but not least, this year we actually opened up our, um, uh, the first hearing we had was actually on race, it was during the interim. And a lot of folks asked us, you know, we, we talk about race a lot in your committee, in specific bills, like, why did you have a hearing specifically on race? Chair Mariani um, and I both often speak to the invisibility of race the closer you look. So as we speak to bills, we often talk about individual policy prescriptions, individual actions. If you look at um, pulling someone over, if you look at the individual policy details of doing that, I'm getting a, a message that I'm actually running a little long. Um, then uh, before I get into any example, it's generally the principle that the closer you look, the more detailed you are, the less you actually speak to race. And so with the limited amount of time, I'm gonna skip, quickly skip through the police accountability bill. Uh, I'm sure the colleagues after me, before me, will speak to that. We did a huge amount of work, and I'm sure during the Q&A session, we'll have plenty of time to speak to that. What I would like to spend my remaining time speaking to is next session and the structural budget issues. Um, currently, we have, um, I'm sure um, both agencies will happily say that we have two unaddressed deficiencies in DOC and DPS, and we have recently, uh, that recently forced uh, DOC to shut down two prisons, and um, DPS is currently also struggling with um, their ability to properly process drug testing for um, those, you know, obviously uh, major drug dealers in their cases. If they're not able to test those uh, kits in a timely manner, then folks are able to, um, you know, criminals are able to stay out and do kind of negative things uh, if professionals larger amounts. Um, long story short, um, 
I think we think that it's very important that we do pass these four funding deficiencies from probation, rate kits, the DOC, and DPS uh, funding deficiency specifically in order to uh, address those structural budget issues, but also just as important to pass criminal justice reform. Lastly, um, to race through it, and my apologies, uh, is um, two items that we think um, should be the future of public safety. And that is the early intervention system and the Office of Community Led Public Safety. Both were a part of the original police accountability bill, and both were scaled back drastically. Uh, early intervention system is simply the ability to monitor use of force, use of force incidents, and actual complaints in a manner that would predictably enable folks, uh, predictably enable both regulators and chief of uh, uh, the chief law enforcement officers to intervene in officers' actions before a Daryl Chauvin appear. So there's been a lot of, uh, it's on the forefront of actually uh, police accountability um, policy research, uh, but it's actually in practice in many localities. And we've put the data provisions into place to allow us to do that statewide and to intervene before folks are actually, uh, before there's actually an incident of a deadly use of force. And lastly, uh, the Office of Community-Led Public Safety is actually uh, the ability to uh, make a large state investment in alternatives to policing, co-responder models, and uh, support for um, non-conventional policing. Uh, we think it's important that the future and modernizing all of our public safety systems, that we stop tasking police with doing jobs that ordinarily should be done by social service workers, ordinarily should be done by mental health workers, and ordinarily should be done by, you know, other individuals, other public safety individuals besides cops. And we think it's important that the state makes a substantial investment into transforming all of our local public safety systems to enable that to occur, to enable them to modernize. And so I will um, uh, wrap up with that, and uh, I, I look forward to any questions, specifically on uh, any item on the outline you may see that are interested to that we're not, uh, we're not able to get to. Thank you so much, Jamal. Um, and yes, we will continue to have the conversation around the recent um, Police Accountability Act that was passed this summer um, and to really be able to, um, to have a conversation about what we have accomplished, but what we still need to accomplish. So thank you. Um, we're gonna move over to Adele, who joins us from the Department of Human Rights. Um, and uh, if you all are not following some of the work that's coming out of this department, you should. Um, we have some of the strongest human rights laws, civil rights laws in this country, um, and we need to leverage them uh, for our community. So thank you, Adele, for joining us. Thank you, Amber. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, and thank you to the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage for putting together this event uh, and the rest of the panelists that are here as well. Uh, my name is Adel Shukuzada, and I'm the Community Engagement Director for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. And as the Community Engagement Director, I help lead education, outreach, and engagement efforts. Um, uh, our department is the state's civil rights enforcement agency. Uh, we strive to ensure everyone in Minnesota can lead full lives, rich with dignity and joy. And our mission is to make Minnesota discrimination free by creating a more equitable Minnesota, create a more inclusive culture, and identify and eliminate discrimination. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we currently have an investigation to the Minneapolis Police Department um, uh, to see if they engaged in, in, un, in unlawful discrimination based on race. Uh, this investigation is just one piece of a broader public conversation around creating public safety and ending discrimination in our communities. And our investigation would not be possible if not for the decades of work from community leaders that continue to fight for structural change. This is the first time that the state launched a civil rights investigation into the systemic discriminatory practices of the largest police department in the state. It's also the only investigation surrounding the killing of, of George Floyd, focusing on the policies and practices implemented by the Minneapolis Police Department. As stated in our temporary restraining order with Minneapolis, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color have suffered generations of pain and trauma as a result of systemic and institutional racism and long-standing policies in uh, policing. 
This continues, uh, this continuous harm was once again highlighted by the in-custody death of George Floyd. On June 2nd, 2020, uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and the Human Rights uh, Commissioner Rebecca Lucero announced to the Minnesota Department of Human Rights um, that we would do an investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department uh, after filing a civil rights charge related to the death of George Floyd. Um, Minnesota has one of the strongest uh, civil rights laws in the country and it is illegal for a police department to discriminate against anyone because of their race. We are investigating policies, procedures, and practices over the past 10 years to determine if the Minneapolis Police Department engaged in systemic discriminatory practices towards people of color. On June 5th, we filed an emergency court action with details on immediate structural changes that the police department must implement. And the city of Minneapolis agreed to these structural changes and joined us, joined us in submitting this court order. Under the court order, chokeholds are immediately banned. Police officers must report and intervene if another officer utilizes an unauthorized use of force. The use of crowd control weapons during protests and demonstrations must only be approved by the chief of police or their designee. Timely and transparent discipline decisions for police officers must be made. And the Minneapolis Civil Rights Department, which is local to the city, may audit body camera footage. A few days later, on June 8th, Hennepin County Court uh, approved the proposed court order and the court has the power to enforce these preliminary measures. Failure to comply with the order could lead to further penalties. Today, our team of neutral investigators is continuing to review 10 years worth of data. The data involves reviewing policies, procedures, and interviewing current and former officers, chiefs of police, city officials, and even some ride-alongs. We have also interviewed hundreds of individuals uh, that have shared their experiences with the Minneapolis Police Department with us. And we wanna make sure we hear from you if you have any relevant information to share that can further this investigation. Whether you had a positive, negative, or neutral experience with the police department, you can call us at 651-539-1100. Again, that's 651-539-1100 or you can fill out a survey on our website at mn.gov backslash mdhr. That's mn.gov backslash mdhr. Translation and interpreters are available over the phone and the survey is available in English, Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Adele. Um, and we're gonna make sure that information is in the chat um, we want to make sure that our community um, is well informed on the updates regarding the uh, investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, we salute all of the organizations in the community who have been doing this work for decades to, to track to make sure that we don't forget any um, instance of excessive force um, by the Minneapolis Police Department or any other police department. And that really set a standard going into the launch of this investigation. So we wanna make sure that we thank um, all of our community um, advocates um, that really did the groundwork before this investigation was even thought of. And so we wanna continue this work forward. Um, Adele has just posted uh, um, some really critical information if you want to contact the Department of Human Rights to share a story. And we're also going to make sure that it's posted on the Facebook um, comment thread as well. So people have that information. Thank you so much, Idel. And then um, we're going to go over to Keon to round us out on this section of our um, of our event today and then we're going to move into some questions and answers so please 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 if you are tuning in um, send in your questions we want to make sure that we are addressing anything that you want to discuss today so thanks Keon. thank you very much amber thank you to Seema, justin jasmine shakir and everyone there i learned uh, a lot of what i know from amber at my time at not so i thank you and i'm glad to be joined up with you again thank you to my fellow panelists who are not only colleagues, but I consider friends.
Nicole, we did a great job on the deadly force encounters and it would not have moved without you. Jamil, obviously at the house, pushing important legislation and Adele doing wonderful work uh, at Human Rights and a brother of mine. Uh, I, I wanna present today about what our office has done. So I'm just gonna share my screen here to get this up. Uh, then. So our office at the Attorney General has two main goals, to help people afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. And Keith has ultimately said, no one is outside our circle of compassion. But we have to realize the criminal justice system has been used to impose a social and economic hierarchy as opposed to a fair system of law. So if you allow me, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the problems we're facing and then move into the solutions. Uh, so race in the criminal justice system. In Minnesota in 2017, black Minnesotans accounted for 34% of the prison population while making up only 6% of the state population here. Uh, in a 10 year period between 2008 and 2018, the black prison population grew by 13% while the white population fell by 2%. Uh, and then I'll get to these photos in a minute too. Gender in the criminal justice system between 2008 and 2018, the number of women in prisons grew uh, three times faster than the number of men. And according to the most recent data available, women comprise of 7% people in the state prisons and 14% of people in our jails. Mental health, extremely important in substance abuse. Uh, the Department of Corrections reports that of the more than 4,300 chemical dependency assessments given in 2017, 92% of people were diagnosed as either chemically abusive or dependent. And then in 2016, more than 1,200 people in Minnesota prisons were diagnosed with personality disorder. Uh, here we are at Faribault Correctional Facility, which used to be uh, a hospital. Now it houses, now it's one of the largest prisons in the state. It shows you that we are criminalizing people with mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, probation, we think of Minnesota as a low incarceral state, while in fact we have the fifth highest rate of supervision in the country. These extreme probation terms, you know, looking at 40 years plus in some areas of our state, um, are responsible for a lot of technical violations would lead to incarceration. In fact, the Minnesota Department of Corrections reported that 60% of the total prison admissions in 2016 were for technical violations, not for a new crime. When you add together uh, our incarceration rates um, totally, that includes prison, jail, probation, supervised release, we're tied with Alabama for number 14 in the country. It's an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace and we must do better. Uh, when we look at voting and the power of people in our state too, Minnesota is one of 18 states where felons may not vote until they complete, completely uh, complete their post-incarceral supervision, such as probation or parole. Since 1974, the percentage of voting age Minnesotans being disenfranchised has increased over 400%, which translates now to more than 52,000 people in Minnesota not being able to vote as a result of the conviction and locking them out in what they say um, even though they're impacted. 70% of people impacted live outside of Hennepin and Ramsey counties. That completely shatters people's uh, perceptions of who they think as criminals and where crime is happening, right? The impact is greater in greater Minnesota because probation terms are an average of 46% longer there. And we know with our high probation rate, number five in the country, it adds to it. So, what have we done in the Minnesota Attorney General's office looking at the problems? We held five listening sessions in Minnesota correctional facilities. We were uh, thought to be the first Attorney General in Minnesota state history to go visit uh, Minnesota prisons and talk with incarcerated peoples there. Uh, those were the photos you saw. We went to Oak Park Heights, Stillwater, Shakopee, the women's prison, um, uh, St. Cloud and our Faribault and St. Cloud. And we've had multiple meetings and regular conversations with impacted family members through the work uh, Nicole helped lead with the Reducing Deadly Force Encounters Working Group uh, and the Commissioner and Attorney General, and really centered the voices of families in the conversations who have lost loved ones at the hands of the police uh, to see how we can come at all angles here. We've also hosted expungement fairs uh, to make sure that we're helping people go through the process. Our first expungement fair we held, we uh, helped over 100 people, and we're only hoping to grow on that, more on that later as well. 
So we've also done legislative solutions and advocacy. I'll talk about some of the limitations we have at the Attorney General's office in the Q&A section, but we have a large platform. And what we've used our platform to do is to advocate for post-conviction relief, probation reform, and easier expungement process. In fact, we are awarded $80,000 uh, to help facilitate and educate more about, about expungements and help folks get off of, uh, help folks uh, expunge their criminal records. Pardon reform. Keith sits on the pardon board with Governor Tim Walls and Chief Justice Gilday. It is something that uh, Minnesota is actually one of the worst in the country on. Alabama, again, deep south, provides hundreds of pardons a year. Minnesota, maybe dozens. So we're trying to really get folks uh, criminal records, pardon, expunge and provide more keys, not more locks. Voting reform. Keith was actually uh, the one that carried the bill and authored it in 2003 to allow folks uh, who are felons to vote. We now believe that you should never lose your voting rights, even when you are in prison, completely decouple voting from being incarcerated. Doesn't make sense. In fact, it might sound radical, but uh, Maine and Vermont, two of the whitest states, do do it, and we should do it here in Minnesota. Nicole touched amazingly on the Reducing Deadly Force Encounters Working Group. Many of our recommendations became law, the duty to intervene, data collection, autism and mental health training, banning chokeholds, peer counseling for officers. You can't have broken people going out and policing our streets. And establishing an independent unit within the BCA, which we heard very loudly from the community that they wanted. We've partnered with law enforcement. We have an extremely close relationship with the United States Attorney's Office. We've asked them to open an investigation to Beltrami County, where in the last five years, four people of color have died. And in those cases, there's been four violations of Minnesota rules. We're looking at everywhere in the state. We're working on other numerous priorities with them, whether that's from COVID, elder justice, and so forth. And we have a very strong and close relationship with the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, who does have primary jurisdiction in these criminal matters. And we think about criminal justice reform, we must think about prosecutions and the prosecutorial discretion they have in charging crimes, whether that be drug crimes, such as marijuana. In 2018, marijuana accounted for 35% of all drug uh, arrests. Blacks in Minnesota are five times more likely to be arrested for marijuana. 11 times more likely than whites in Goodhue County in greater Minnesota. How can we transform criminal justice by working with prosecutors and changing that charging? And you know, a quick case study I'll talk about is the Hennepin County Juvenile Detention Center. Since, 20, since 2005, the population there has decreased by 72% and they're putting more folks in programs like YouthLink. 86% of folks don't reoffend within the first six months. That is a model that we should be following. Uh, on the state level. And I wanna talk to, you know, when we talk about criminal justice, there are impacts of social and economic factors that are deep in our history from Jim Crow and racist policies that we must acknowledge. In Minnesota housing, we have the largest gap in the country between blacks and whites for home ownership rates. We, in Minneapolis, they trail by 51 points, half the national rate of home ownership at 22%. Minnesota's ranked among the worst states with racial uh, disparities in home ownership. More than 560,000 renters are cost burden, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on rent. 40% are people of color compared to 23% of white households. Wealth and poverty. The state of Minnesota has the second biggest income inequality gap. Poverty among whites is 7%, while the rate is four times higher for black Minnesotans at 28%. 33% of black children live in poverty. That is a disgrace, an absolute disgrace, five times higher than white children. The median household income for black families is about half that of white families. The unemployment gap is at 8%. This is pre-COVID, mind you, pre-COVID. Imagine what it is now, and not only the disparities we have in our health system for black folks on, for COVID. And education, worst in the nation. In 2003, 36% of black students graduated while 79% of whites did. That gap has shrunk, but it's still the worst. 44 in standardized testing. More than 200 schools in our state are made of students of colors when 90% of or more the enrollment is people of color. Those are segregated schools. Our children are getting subpar education, living in poverty, spending a lot on housing, and are locked out of income inequality opportunities. 
So when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, it runs deep. And then allow me to go on to healthcare, black women, one and a half more times likely in native mothers, having point eight times more likely to die during pregnancy. Asthma rates, we know in North Minneapolis, the Herc incinerator, four times more likely there. Don't even get me started on uh, heart disease. And then health insurance coverage. All these factors contribute to a system that is unfair. So what are we doing on these? We're protecting Minnesotans for evictions during COVID-19. We've created a wage theft unit to protect workers and their money, uh, a lot of low income workers especially. Defending the Affordable Care Act from the Trump administration, working on reducing pharmaceutical drug prices and prevented many, uh, presented many uh, recommendations to the legislature, such as the insulin bill. We won a national award for that. Uh, and then we're advocating for legislative proposals, suing student borrowers and protecting uh, higher education. This is wage theft. I want people to understand how serious the problem of wage theft is as I wrap up. When you take all the larceny, burglary, auto theft, and robbery in our country, it is pennies compared to what employers are stealing from our black and brown workers. So we are standing up at the attorney general's office every single day, not only in criminal justice, but in the factors that lead to criminal justice. So with that, I'll wrap up my comments and be there for uh, questions. And thank you again to Asima. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kian. Thank you to all of our panelists for your um, just amazing presentations. There's so much to unpack. There's so much to respond to. Um, but we're so grateful for you um, stepping into these roles and really ensuring um, that your work is pushing for equity in these systems. So we're going to transition into some Q&A to talk about the work ahead. Um, I want to continue to encourage people who are tuning in, whether they are on Facebook or they're logged in on Zoom, to please, please, please send in questions um, before we wrap up so that we can get to anything that you need us to address. Um, so at this time, uh, we want to talk about some more deeply some of your work, how you're trying to move the needle forward on a lot of these issues. We have some pre-written questions um, that we're going to ask you to respond to. Um, and then uh, we would love to answer any questions from the audience. So please send them in. Um, so I'm going to first turn it over to Jamel. Um, and feel free to um, just share more about from your expertise. Um, what do we need to pursue to transform our justice system? How are you leveraging your position at the legislature to move Minnesota forward? Um, especially um, given the work that you are really stepping into this a little, all of our work is political, um, but you are in a more, you know, political space in particular, you know, whilst trying to stay nonpartisan on the call, because we're not person, <laughs> we have to stay nonpartisan as an agency, but, um, and also if you want to share a little bit more of your comments um, that you wanted to share earlier on, please do. So we'll turn over first to Jamel to talk more about Hello. Um, so I like to say that it's uh, what am I doing to leverage uh, everything <laughs> possible. Um, so I mean, there's a few buckets I can kind of speak to. Um, I think most a lot of them ride under kind of breaking our culture. Um, and I know that may sound drastic, but we currently have a culture that incentivizes inaction. Um, and um, a lot of folks think that's a virtue. That's not a folks will remind me constantly that uh the inaction is a feature, not a bug of a legislative process. Um, however, um, I think a lot of what we're looking to do in our roles and my role specifically is to when the legislative process um, leads to inaction is to look for other ways for agencies and other individuals to act. Um, so a great example for this is uh, we, re we wrote our, our original police accountability bill written last year, which uh, by the way, it's a very little fanfare and a lot of, uh, I mean, it literally was the only uh, bill I think we passed where we, uh, the county attorneys and uh, the police uh, unions came forth and, and just dumped on us. Like <laughs> they just said, this is, you know, we're never going to do this. And, and a lot of those provisions are in law currently. Um, but one of those provisions we tried to pass was, hey, let's collect data on, you know, racial profiling for traffic stops. And we uh, encountered a huge amount of resistance. But in attempting to pass that bill, we learned a lot about. Um, how the technical um, traffic stops work, how data is recorded in that um, system. And we found that 
it's a statewide system administrative administrated by actually the courts and that every two years it asks for public comment and how to change that system currently there is no field for race in the statewide uh, traffic stops and so if we were to mandate that they do that it would cost millions and millions of dollars to update this system and uh, but if we just had folks write a letter into the minnesota court system then when they update the system, it would be free. It wouldn't require a passing of the law and individual localities then would have the ability to collect data depending upon, for instance, if folks would pressure their city council or folks pressure their, but a part of that is a, the technical aspect of knowing uh, what can individual citizens do to change these areas, but also understanding the cultural shift for us of, of a legislature in a chair, especially in divided government, not relying on the passage of a bill to enact the change of a policy. Um, and um, that is a huge cultural shift for a lot of folks um, in, in our institution because oftentimes it's like, are we gonna pass a bill or not? And if we don't pass a bill, then oh well, we can't do anything. And, um, and I'm sure um, th there were a lot of conversations around um, Minnesota Citizen Guidelines Commission and even this uh, the police accountability legislation. Um, but, but there's a lot of things we're trying to, we're trying to do along those lines. So similarly, right now we're looking into prosecutor data. Um, currently, we don't collect any data on prosecutors. Um, so if you want to compare apples to apples on, you know, anything about prosecutors, there's no central repository. And so uh, we don't need to pass a bill to change that. In fact, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission currently has the, you know, statutory delegated authority to collect that data. That data is currently collected by the Minnesota court system. Uh, what we're looking to do is just have conversations, hold meetings, force them to interact with each other, and uh, the chair is open to publishing that data to allow for um, you know, Minnesota citizens and policymakers to be more informed on the patterns of county attorneys. And then lastly, I'll leave with all the data that Keon presented previously is just incredible. It's extremely helpful. But the way we talk about bills and policy actually um, rejects, it actually pushes away those broad statements. So if you say, Keon says, like, you know, like, we have a high probation rate, so we'll have a bill to look at technical violations. If we, if, when that bill is presented before the committee, there is a peppering of questions about the individual, appropriately so, the individual technical aspects. There's a whole bunch of questions, like, for instance, the technical violations bill, they're saying, like, oh, well, you know, can we default um, when people have drug abuse problems and send them to treatment? Well, the question is, do we have enough treatment facilities in greater Minnesota? We get into this large technical conversation. And meanwhile, year after year, we have a racist system. Year after year, we have a disproportionately cruel system that punishes people needlessly and has negative impacts on our state. And, it's, um, and so what the chair and I have tried to do is uh, have a, have themed based conversations. Let's not talk about an individual small slice of changing this one part of the system. Let's talk about juvenile justice generally. Let's have a presentation in the beginning and talk about all the problems so that when we do have a vote, when we do talk about moving on these items, we do so with the context that our system is currently broken. And it's more important to change that system to act than to allow it to continue to do the damage that it does. Those are very difficult conversations. Those are um, our tough conversations, but I just, you know, and I guess give all the power to Keon in the world. It's, it's funny because, you know, essentially gave an abbreviated version of a two hour hearing that we had. Um, and that, you know, our GOP colleagues, only two of them showed up for, you know, out of 20, by the way. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to do, but I just am encouraged by the fact that there's a whole bunch of almost invisible levers within agencies that will allow for individuals to act, and individuals being private citizens, elected officials, or uh, the council itself. And I've been very um, happy to hear about the direction the council's been going with the leadership of Justin and with you coming on, Amber. It's been very helpful to have a partner that can actually speak, again, on those broader issues. Because if you ask a specific question about, you know, child separation policy, and you don't intentionally ask about race, then race will disappear. And um, so it's important we have folks with that equity lens asking those hard questions. So, I mean, again, there's a lot, again, there's 40 plus bills, everything from collateral consequences to 
restore the role to. But I tend to think that, again, the technical individual bills are not as important as the big themes or the big cultural shifts. Because what prevents those bills from passing is the frameworks people use to think about our current system. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. It's so funny because um, we just had um, someone from Child Support um, come in uh, to our council meeting. So it's within the realm of things. Um, but just like seeing that whole, that whole set of systems, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's uh, family separation, whether it's the child support system, and just how, you know, like we have to ask those pointed questions. Like you said, we have to track the data. Um, the data, if we have it, we, and we can be able to tell the story, but a lot of times we're not. So I'm glad to hear about some of the things that we can do, um, pulling the levers internally without necessarily waiting for legislative changes to pass. So just continue to um, move these levers along. So thank you so much. So I'm going to go and, over and, um, and to- And Amber? Oh yeah, and, go ahead. Amber. And at the risk of uh, belaboring the point, I do want to just make it so to be specific about the legislature and how we approached our work, right? So what we did, right? Yeah. So for instance, um, folks, uh, this is speak to the kind of the big hot button issue folks are kind of wondering about, I assume, is the George Floyd piece of legislation. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not going to talk out of school but I, uh, about the negotiation or anything confidential, but I will say that during the negotiation, uh, this is not a secret, um, Normally, legislative negotiations, what occurs, the culture is, hey, the Senate has some items, the House has some items, we walk in, we first agree to what we both agree to, and then we talk about whether we can swap items or reach to agreement or anything else. Mm -hmm. If the time runs out, then we've already agreed to things, so we'll pass what we agreed to, right? But what, it also, what, what that often does is allow only allow for the lowest common denominator thing to pass, uh, and not for any actual systemic reform or big items to pass. And so the chair and the committee and the policy talkers had this broader discussion about that normal culture, that normal procedure. And so when the chair walked into the meeting, leading the negotiation um, on actually Juneteenth, right? He walked in and he said, hey, I imagine we can agree on everything you've passed, mm -hmm. but we will not, it's not worth a discussion because it's not worth actually agreeing to any of that and having a discussion and going through the side by side and doing the whole conference committee show unless you at first agree that this is a systemic problem requiring a bold systemic solution um and so two months later they have yet to answer so that was the question on the table two months later they've yet to answer that question however what we did was at least in our opinion of systems change and we only got that because we did not go through the normal negotiation process. We didn't agree to their five small bills immediately and try to pass that. We said we won't pass anything until we do something worthwhile. That's different from the legislature. Um, it's different from business as usual, but it allowed for the Posse Caucus and Chair Mariani to come out with some victories that empowered agencies to actually begin to uh, change the way they, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they perform their work, so. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm gonna go over to Adele um, to um, pose a question to him. And then also um, there was a question asked um, by Suzanne on Facebook. And I know that um, Adele wants to address part of that question as well to talk about the message um, you want youth to hear. Um, so Adele, what opportunities does Minnesota have in our, as we said, it's one of the strongest states for our civil rights law. So what are those opportunities um, that we have to prevent and address racial discrimination um, using the Minneapolis Police Department as an example, but we can also go a little bit broader than that. And then in addition to that, um, addressing Suzanne, part of Suzanne's question around what message do you want youth to hear in particular? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Amber. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's exactly right. We have, uh, as an agency, we enforce what is known as the uh, Minnesota Human Rights Act. And it's a tremendous tool that we have in our state to address systemic uh, issues of discrimination. Uh, and it's a tool that when used um, can bring about policy and practical changes in people's lives. Um, so I mentioned this during the, the presentation and I, I want to be careful because we have an active investigation. So I have to 
um, you know, uh, acknowledge that as well. But we have already put in place a court order that is putting a ban on chokeholds, is requiring that police officers, letting them know they have a duty to uh, intervene if there's a use of uh, unnecessary deadly force. And so, you know, those solutions didn't come out of a vacuum either, right? Those are solutions that are out there in community. We saw them implemented in Chicago and in Ferguson, and we were able to do that here in Minnesota through our Human Rights Act. Um, and so uh, whether it is in response to the Minneapolis Police Department or more broadly, you know, sexual harassment, uh, denial of a promotion uh, by an employer, whatever the case may be, um, you, there's civil rights that you have here in the state. Uh, and it's really important that you call our office because our neutral investigators are great at what they do. They look at the evidence, they look at what is there uh, and then use that to be able to bring about change. But if we don't know that it's happening, if we aren't hearing from folks about their personal experiences, then we're not able to use that tool. Um, to, to Susan's uh, question about what message do, do, should you be hearing? Um, uh, I think use your voice, continue using your voice. You've been using it uh, already uh, and it's led to some great changes, but you gotta, you gotta keep doing it. Whether it's showing up to a protest, writing a letter to the editor, um, whether it's through art or, you know, a group coming together and standing at a corner of a, uh, of a intersection, handing out flyers, like whatever that thing is for you, do it. And there is this fierce urgency of now, but it's also a marathon. It's going to take time. So be patient, be kind to each other, uh, and never, never waver, uh, from what it is you're trying to accomplish. Your voice is very powerful. It does lead to change may not feel like it, um, but those small changes become huge changes down the road. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. Um, we're going to move uh, over to uh, Nicole. I'm going to ask a question to you. Can you speak more to how, so you talked about the working group on police involved deadly force encounters, um, which was very comprehensive. We're already starting to see some of those recommendations be implemented through policy, through law. Um, so how can we continue to leverage those findings? Um, even thinking about some of the, the findings that people may not have expected that, I mean, we have African heritage people in greater Minnesota throughout the state. Um, and knowing that our policing systems, public safety systems throughout the state are more um, disproportionately affecting our greater Minnesota family, you know what I'm saying? So how can we utilize more of these findings to, and leverage them um, to further the transformative reforms we need in our justice system? Well, that's a, that's a really important aspect of, of the work. Um, and, you know, with the recommendations, there were different categories or owners assigned to what those recommendations were. Some of them were assigned to the Department of Public Safety. Some of them needed to be started or prompted from the legislature or the governor or the attorney general needed to carry on conversations and conversations that needed to happen that resulted in change. And so, um, so each of the system stakeholders have been assigned something as well as local government and um, local government and tribal governments where the police department lives, um, the mayors, the city councils. So first, I would say for people that are interested in the recommendations, find the recommendations online. You can go to, again, dps.mn.gov and type in deadly force encounters, pull up the recommendations, take a look at them. Um, engage with your local government. If you live in a suburb or you live in rural Minnesota, um, Find out who your city council people are, who are elected officials in your local government, and ask them if they're aware of the recommendations. Um, find, you can ask questions. There's questions, you know, um, regarding, you know, out of the recommendations, some easy places to start might be to ask, does your police department include community in the hiring process? You've got hiring and recruitment and training. So asking questions about how our community involved in that process, are they reflected in the process? Um, um, we've got training. So what kind of training um, outside of 
whatever standard training police have. You know, if you have an area of interest and you're concerned about whether or not your police department has done that training, it's okay to ask. Um, reach out and ask, are you doing, have you been doing autism training or um, training for a particular um, um, segment of the community that may need some different type of a response from the police department or that may need just a better relationship to be able to get to know what the needs of the community are. Um, so reaching out and having those conversations, it doesn't have to just be your elected officials, it can be your public administrators too. And um, one of the groups that I've been talking with around follow-up and action, I want to give them a shout out. And that's the, um, the National Association of Black Public Administrators. I didn't know there was one. Um, and, and, you know, they're all around the state too, and they're interested and they care. And so Hearing from people that are interested is going to continue to build the momentum at the local level that's needed to make the changes that only the local level can do. Um, and so that would be my guidance is find the report, reach out to your local government, and then just tap your other city officials that, um, that you might know. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. I actually want to do a very quick follow up because I know there's been some questions about um when officers are um involved in deadly um uh, deadly force encounters or maybe convicted of murder um that there is not a revoking of their pensions um and i know that we've been trying to ask questions about this in the chat not fully sure on the answer but you bring up a good point about what's in the local authority versus what the state has jurisdiction over um, and um, if you're able to talk a little bit more, we briefly touched on the post board, um, but when we talk about some of the reforms that the state in particular is trying to do um, at the post board level um, to try to put more accountability on officers who have used excessive or deadly force um, and ensuring that um, they possibly, you know, can have their license revoked. And so just, what is the post board, number one? <laughs> um, and what are some opportunities there as well? Yeah, that's another great question. So the post board, the Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, licenses police officers in the state of Minnesota. Um, one of the conversations that was um, brought up during the working group process and deliberation and testimony was, um, what role does the post board have when you have officers that may have been disciplined, that may have um, been terminated even from their agency and they wanna move and hire to another agency. Um, so the post board had less of a role, I think, in tracking and monitoring the movement, um, but that is gonna change, I believe. So they're, um, they're gonna be working to build and I'm not an expert on post and I don't wanna speak for them. And um, I know there was uh, some uh, reform measures passed in the police accountability bill um, that gives the post board m more teeth which was needed in order to make some of those accountability measures happen um, at the at a broader umbrella level so um, those are coming i also i can't really speak to the question about the pension issue i don't know the answer to that and i don't yeah. know where that lives so yes um, i'd like to answer it but i don't have that yeah, I think the pensions piece is an example of local versus state authority, obviously, because mm -hmm. police departments, local police departments are fund through local budgets, they're paying the pensions. And I, um, I certainly think for people who are interested in digging more into that might want to look at some local authorities for some of those given cases. Um, it's definitely a local contract issue. Um, but these are really great questions and part of why we want to do this event in particular um, was to really talk about what is the state's authority and the state's leverage as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and in the interest of time, we're going to move on. I want to make sure that Kian um, has an opportunity to have his question asked before we close. Um, so Kian, in recent months, there's been a public discussion of expanding powers of the Attorney General's office in Minnesota as a strategy to address justice issues. So we've been seeing more, um, especially, and I know you all cannot speak on the investigation within, um, from, you know, George Floyd and the officers involved because it is an active investigation. 
Um, so we want to respect that um, that privilege to to not comment. Um, but just as a briar in the midst of this time um, and seeing some of what Attorney General um, Ellison has done, there's been this kind of response back to can we expand his powers, can expand the office's powers and this that, and the third. So there's been a lot of public discussion about that. Um, but what is the scope of influence as you have already kind of started to talk about in your presentation um, within the Attorney General's office? Um, and what's your take on this conversation regarding the expansion of powers of the office? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me back up and say what the Attorney General's office does. We represent over 100 boards, commissions, and agencies, including the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, Education, the Post Board. So we actually uh, are the attorneys for those uh, commissions and agencies. In criminal matters, we don't have primary jurisdiction, and essentially, unless it's a Medicaid fraud issue. And essentially what that means is if there's a criminal matter such as a homicide um, or a theft, whatever it may be, that goes to your county attorney. The only way we get involved is if the county attorney invites us in. And this typically happens um, in smaller counties outside of the you know, major seven or eight that there are uh, that work on, uh, that have the capability to do this work. Um, so a lot of times we're you know, out in Candy, Ohio County, for example, where they might not have a large uh, prosecutorial force to deal with a murder where they haven't seen one in years, we'll, they'll invite us in um, and that's how we'll get the case. Uh, that's what happened in uh, the Floyd case. The county attorney, Mike Freeman, called and asked Keith to come in and then Governor Walls used 8.01 uh, to allow Keith to become the prosecutor. Uh, otherwise, it always goes through the county attorney first. Uh, the scope of our work is limited because we do represent these agencies. Um, and, you know, we don't tell them what to do. We just represent them. However, we use um, our relationships with the agencies to push as much as we can in a respectable and ethical boundary of what we can do for criminal justice reform and all types of reforms uh, to help the people of Minnesota. Um, in terms of getting at your question, uh, what do we think about this issue? This was actually one of the things that came out of the working group was that we would continue and Nicole alluded to this with conversations. Uh, we continue to have conversations with the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Um, the Minnesota County Attorney Association uh, wanted to give Keith this power. They went to the legislature um, and advocated for that. Unfortunately, the legislature um, you know, didn't move forward. But the way we view it is we're not going to be the ones to say whether we want it or not, because that's you know, kind of power grabby. We want to you know, have the ability to say if the legislature gives us the power, we would humbly, respectfully, uh, accept it. And if they don't, they don't. We're just going to continue with our business. But it is not to say without, if we were to get that power, we would need resources um, as well. Little known fact um, about our criminal division is we used to have 10 attorneys working in our criminal division helping uh, do their appellate work and county attorneys across the state. Now we only have one. So, you know, we, we need the resources to help build up in our office. We used to have 600 attorneys, we used to have 500 attorneys. Now we're down to about 250 or so. So our, our office has shrunk in the scope and we need to have the resources if we're gonna do this work. But the short version of the answer is if the legislature gives us the uh, power to do so, we take it, but we don't really take a position one way or the other. Thank you so much, Keon, um, for your response. And I just want to thank you all um, for engaging in our, our Q&A section. Thank you to our community members who have sent in some very important questions um, uh, regarding just all of these different types of issues. Um, and I wish we had more time <laughs> to get into all of it. Um, but just know that the, con the conversation is continuing after today. I want to continue to move this work forward. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining us um, as we start this conversation. It's not ending today. So as we close, I always like to allow our um, panelists to just give a, a quick closing send off. Um, this is just something that I like to do that allows you to uh, send some encouragement um, and inspiration to those who are joining us tonight. Um, this has been a difficult few months for all of us in so many ways. 
Um, and especially for you all that have been in this fight before um, May 25th, 2020, um, and still in it now, and really motivating yourself to get back into it every day, I would just love for each of you to just share some inspirational remarks and some encouragement for us all as we close. Um, so first, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jamel um, to share just some closing remarks before we close. Sorry, didn't we unmute together? Um, um, <laughs> for me, the most inspirational portion of uh, this work this year, especially in relation to George Floyd, has been um, A, or, or has been the fact that we tried before um, the activists became involved. Um, Chair, Mary, Chair Mariani and I spent, we, we read all, I think it's 20 reports that have been put out in Minnesota over the last 30, 40 years. We put together a bill that we thought were smart, that didn't demonize police, that we thought was worthwhile of passing. We thought we had the leverage when it came to police funds. So we thought we could actually pass some strong police accountability legislation, and it landed like a thud in the Senate. <laughs> um, and we struggled to get you know um, the, the public involved. Uh, to get our leadership's attention, even to get the, you know, the governor's attention and so forth. Not to say that, you know, anything negative of them, but, I, you know, everyone will admit that before the killing of George Floyd, that this issue of police accountability wasn't nearly a global pressing issue. Um, but since the death of George Floyd, and, you know, rest in peace, um, I've seen the incredible work of activists that I know, I mean, um, that, that we all know in the streets, that have raised in the streets of Minnesota, uh, folks don't even think of it as a, you know, has a strong black presence, has awoken the globe when an able and empowered legislation to pass. And so I just wanna just, uh, folks who are listening um, to know that it, we tried it before. We've tried the exact same bill, part, some of the exact same bills with the exact same language and we were told, no way, no how. Um, and because of the, the, the mass movement that was led by those in the streets of Minnesota, um, we were able to actually get some of those pieces past the finish line. Now, is it where I wanted to be? Definitely not. But to me, that always tells me to keep striving, always reminds me that the work of those, that we can't do our work as uh, you know, folks within the system without those folks outside of the system pushing us and pushing uh, you know, the folks in power. So for me, that's always inspiring. And I'm just thankful for anyone, especially those who've attended a protest, who attended a meeting, who've come out, who are paying attention now, your voice is so needed and actually has made a huge difference, so. Thank you so much, Jamal. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Nicole to give her last words for tonight. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks, I just wanna say thanks to all the panelists to Adele done some great work with you over the um, last month too. So um, just thanks for being a part of this, everybody, Jamal. Um, so my words, I'll say for, for two different types of in comments here. One, for the folks that are working in the system, for my colleagues in the state, um, whether you're in education or, or DHS or housing or, um, MDH or wherever you are and you're working on these issues and it's hard, just keep doing it because we see you <laughs> and we're happy that you're here and we're happy that you're working with us um, and we need each other. So um, just hang in there and keep, know that we're all there. We're all with you. Um, and then for those that are interested or curious or you're not already involved, but you want to know like where to start, I say just get curious. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to pick, you know, everything to, to be um, extremely vocal about. But if there is something that piques your curiosity, follow the thread and ask the questions and start with your um, local government. It's your tax dollars. Um, they are there in service of their constituents and that's you. And so ask the questions, get curious um, and, and see what unfolds because you might turn over some rocks that people don't expect and that will um that aren't necessarily boulders <laughs> and they'll and they might move and you might be surprised i've seen it happen in my 20 some years of working in government what a question can do so 
um, just keep asking questions. Thank you, Nicole. Next up, we'll have Adele. Hi. Uh, so I think what inspires me, um, I mean, this, these are difficult conversations and, and there are times that I think we all feel a little tired. And what inspires me is the decades of work from community activists and leaders that have been um, fighting for structural changes for longer than I have been alive. Um, and, and I always reflect on um, this line in the Minnesota Human Rights Act. It, it was passed in 1967. Uh, and it says uh, very clearly, discrimination threatens the rights and privileges of the inhabitants of this state and menace the institutions and foundations of democracy. That is the public policy of our state when it comes to discrimination and why it is so important that we dismantle racism, homophobia, sexism, ableism, and really create that state uh, where people can lead those lives full of dignity and joy. And so um, I, I always take solace in that, in, in the fact that there are people that have been, that have paved the way for me to be where I am now. Um, and, and it's because of their commitment uh, that I can have these conversations with, with you all. Uh, and so that's what motivates me to continue moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Even being able to cite legislation from the 60s and just to hold that, you know, hold that in 2020. Thank you. Keon, you got the last words. <laughs> Uh, what I think about is the famous sociologist from the Kerner Commission about 50 years ago said, we read the reports in 1988, 1919, riot in Chicago, the 35 Harlem riot, the 43 riots, the Watts riots, the Kerner Commission. And it's like this Alice in Wonderland with the same picture re-showing over and over again, the same analysis, the same recommendations in the same inaction. We are at an inflection point to reimagine what public safety is, not only in this city, this state, but this country. And Minneapolis and Minnesota can be the leaders of this. And everyone is a part of the movement to lead it. And I think uh, what I always think about is when politicians uh, feel the heat, they see the light, as Keith always says. And it's up to us to put the heat on the politicians. And in the darkest days, we have to think um, about what I think about the man in the arena quote from Teddy Roosevelt that says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short and short and again, and who spends himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never knew victory nor defeat. So I challenge all of us, even if it may be tough to strive for greatness, to strive for challenge, because as the great Angela Davis says, freedom is a constant struggle and we must constantly struggle for a better world for our children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I am just so grateful for the time that you spent and whether you participated as one of our amazing panelists or you tuned in or logged in. Thank you for this important, important conversation and the work is only beginning. So continue to work with us, to struggle with us at the Capitol. Um, I'm just gonna close out um, with some very brief announcements from the council. First of all, we are continuing the series into September. Um, so please join us so on September 3rd. We're gonna talk about economic development and then on the 17th, public health and wellness to close out the series. And so feel free to make sure that you are registered um, to be a part of those conversations. Um, in addition, uh, we have our monthly council meetings uh, where we meet with our actual council members. And we also bring in special guests throughout the state system, commissioners and other leaders as well. It's a very informative space to be in if you wanna continue to learn more about the council. Um, you can log in on Facebook and watch those, um, or you can make sure um, if you are um, subscribed to our newsletter, 
you can learn more information about how to participate in our public comment section. That is on our council meetings are on the second, excuse me, second uh, Tuesday of each month. So the next one will be on September 8th. Um, and then finally, um, not finally, this is my second to last announcement. <laughs> we also have, um, yes, thanks, Adele. We try to make it a very great newsletter <laughs> and informative. Shout out to Shakira, who really does a lot of great work on our newsletter. Um, so on, on our third Tuesdays of the month, so the next one, September 15th, we host legislative training. So Jasmine Carey, our legislative and policy director, leads a very thorough training, and it's so good. And it's every month. So Black folks, people of African heritage, please learn how to navigate the, uh, navigate the state system, navigate the Capitol, um, contact your legislator, set up visits, um, all of that good stuff. Um, we want to make sure we are prepared and ready to move when session comes back um, in 2021. So please sign up for that. Um, and then finally, um, as you all may know, we are in a leadership transition. And so tomorrow is actually our last day with our outgoing executive director, Justin Terrell, who's done so much great work um, to move this work forward at the council and we wish him well. Um, the job description is up on um, the state website and the posting actually closes on the 25th, which is next Tuesday, I believe. So please, if you know someone, if you're that someone that you think should be um, the next leader of our council, please, please, please don't hesitate to put in your application. So I'm going to post some links um, with all that information so that you can be um, tapped in and um, being able to continue, continue re your relationship with the council moving forward. So once again, I just thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our guests and our, um, our viewers. And until next time, have a great day. Have a great weekend.